Coming up, Thanksgiving myths. Does turkey really make you sleepy? We'll take a look at some of the common Thanksgiving myths and find out what's fact and what's fiction. Then your latest questions about the road to recovery. Why do you need the vaccine on your arm? Also ahead, the heat is on. Why some experts are worried this winter may cost your family a whole lot more money. Plus, on the move, pilgrimage is underway as the monarch butterflies head for warmer weather. And helping hand, this teenager's wish has come true for families in need. His inspiring story just ahead. Also, my one-on-one -on -one with one of our regular nightly kids viewers who had a whole lot of questions for, well, me. Why do they call you an anchor? That's a good question. All that and more coming up. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's great to be with you guys. We have a terrific lineup today. Everything from heating costs explained to butterflies on the move to a 13-year-old boy who turned his wish into a way to help those in need this holiday season. Plus, we'll take you behind the scenes right here. So what do you do during the commercials? <laughs> during the commercials, I usually read the scripts for the next part of the, of the program. Those answers coming up a bit later on. But first, let's begin with the Thanksgiving holiday. Many of us will be sitting down with our families next week for Thanksgiving dinner, from turkey to stuffing to all those delicious desserts. But have you ever wondered about some of the holiday myths out there and also what you can do after you eat a big meal? Our pal, Dr. John Torres, takes a look. Thanksgiving a holiday known for its food and the amount of it that we all tend to eat. But there are some common myths about the holiday that I'm ready to debunk. First off, turkey makes you sleepy. In this case, that's a myth. I hear this all the time. That's because turkey naturally contains an ingredient called tryptophan, which in really high quantities can make you tired. But you'd have to eat several pounds of turkey to get enough tryptophan to make you sleepy. The real reason people get tired is that our body is working overtime to digest all that food we just ate. And speaking of tired, you might get the urge to lay down and take a nap after that Thanksgiving meal. But that's not the best idea. Instead, try going for a walk. This helps food move through your body and digestive system much faster. Now what about the theory that you shouldn't eat breakfast so you have more room for that big meal? Well, that's a myth too. If you skip breakfast, you're gonna be so hungry by Thanksgiving mealtime that you could eat way too much food, including too many sweets, before your body has a chance to tell you that you're full. And this could make you feel not so good. And finally, you can gain five pounds on Thanksgiving? Well, that's another myth. One meal will not make you gain that much weight, but it could upset your stomach. So pace yourself and stop when you're full. Now here's a tip when it comes to mealtime. Fill your plate with veggies first while you still have room and try to cover about half of your plate with those vegetables. Then you can add in all the other delicious foods. And start with small portions of everything. That way you get to try all the foods without overeating. Small servings, a balanced plate, a post-meal walk, and great times with family and friends are all ingredients to a wonderful Thanksgiving. Dr. John Torres, thank you as always, my friend. Let's talk now about another story we continue to follow closely here on Kids Edition and also on my nightly news evening broadcast. And that, of course, is the pandemic and the road to recovery. Well, we got some new questions in this week and here to help answer them in our Ask the Doc series is our friend, Dr. Natalie Azar. Dr. Natalie, thank you for being with us. Great to have you with us. Our first question is a timely one. It's about the coronavirus vaccine for younger kids. It comes from Henry. Hi, my mom says that vaccines put superheroes into my body, but I really have superheroes in my body right now. How do vaccines really work? Thanks. Bye. Dr. Natalie, that's a really good question. The thought of superheroes running through my veins is kind of cool. I know, I love that question. It's a great question, Henry. And the way I'm gonna answer it is to say that the vaccine isn't actually giving you superheroes. The vaccine is making your body 
make your own superheroes. So if you think about it this way, when you get sick and you feel lousy, your body's immune system starts to attack that bug that's making you feel sick and you get better. The way the vaccine works is it shows you a little tiny little piece of a bug, not enough to get you sick, but just enough so that your immune system, those fighting soldiers called antibodies, can be produced and that way, the next time, if you get exposed to that coronavirus, that thing that can make you sick with COVID-19, your body's superheroes, those fighting soldiers, are ready and waiting to kill that bug. What a terrific answer. Our next question is also about the vaccine. This comes from a third grader. Hi, my name is Reineris. I'm a third grader in the Black Zone School. And my question is, why do you need the vaccine on your arm? And what would happen if it was on another part of your body? Bye, I love Nightly News Kids Edition. Thank you for that question. And this is one I have really wondered about too, Dr. Natalie, why does it have to be the arm? Well, I don't think any of us remembers when we were little, little teeny tiny babies, but babies actually get shots in their leg. And then as we get older, we start transitioning to the arm. And there's nothing really special about the arm per se. The shot needs to go into your muscle. And for many of us, and for most of us, the arm is just a very easy place to reach. We got a big shoulder muscle right there, and that's exactly where the shot needs to go. But technically speaking, it could kind of go into any area of the body where there is a muscle. Great question and a great answer. And Dr. Natalie, with the Thanksgiving holiday coming up, many families might be planning to get together. We know there are COVID-19 vaccines now available both for kids over five and adults. But new cases continue to pop up. What's your advice to families and how they can stay safe this Thanksgiving while enjoying each other's company? Celeste, I think for families, the easiest way to think about it is that there's four categories of things that they can do or be aware of to stay safe. Number one is, as you mentioned, anyone who's eligible for a vaccine should be vaccinated. That's still your best defense against infection. And the second one is masking. Even if you are vaccinated and you're in a super, super crowded indoor place, you might want to consider wearing a mask. And if you're not vaccinated, you really need to mask all the time. The third thing is setting. It's really important that you're not in you know, crowded spaces indoors. Think outdoors, well-ventilated. And lastly, Lester, it's testing. I'm sure a lot of kids have been tested so far. I know all of us have. Testing is one of your best defenses and best friends during this time. Testing before and after you travel will keep you and your loved ones safe. All right. Dr. Natalie, really great to have you with us today. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, Lester. All right. Well, speaking of the holidays, Thanksgiving is just around the corner, followed by Hanukkah and then Christmas, of course, in late December. And also accompanying these holidays, winter. And some experts are predicting this winter you and your families may need more than just an extra sweater. Our friend Stephanie Rule explains why. It's November, and depending on where you live, it might already be getting cold. So cold that you've had to bring out your big heavy coat and hat to go outside. If that's the case, it's also likely you've been turning up the heat in your house to stay warm. But if your mom and dad have been telling you to put on a sweater instead, it might be because they're worried about higher heating bills this winter. Why? Well, people who work for the federal government who study this stuff say this winter could be a bit colder than it was last year. And if it is, that means it's going to take more energy to keep your house a certain temperature, say 68 degrees. Well, at the very same time, the price to keep your house warm is getting higher because there's a lot more demand than there is supply. When that happens, prices can go up. It's something you may have heard your parents saying recently. Why does everything cost so much more? Well, a lot depends on how you heat your home. Now, almost half of every household in this country uses natural gas to stay warm. It's like the gas you see on your kitchen stove. If you live in a house like that, those same government experts believe your parents could end up spending 30% more than they did last year. That's a really big increase. Other homes, especially those in the northeast part of the country, they use heating oil. It's expected to cost those families more than 40% compared to last year. While down south, a lot of homes use electricity to stay warm. Those prices are expected to go up, but not as much as the others. Now, how much all of this costs really depends on how cold this winter is and how cold or warm you keep that thermostat. So don't be surprised this holiday if you get an extra sweater or two, because you might be wearing them indoors. 
All right, Stephanie, thanks so much for that. Let's switch gears now and talk about a big move that is happening right now. It's the monarch butterflies. And our friend Carrie Sanders is here with more as they take flight. Lester, butterflies, they're mesmerizing. And right now, there's one type of butterfly known as the monarch that's on an incredible journey. Come along. Orange and black. About the size of a four-year-old's hand spread wide open. Their weight, no more than a paper clip. The mighty monarch butterfly. They may appear to zigzag with no destination in mind, but they know exactly where they're going. This is a beautiful, glorious monarch. This little guy makes a spectacular journey. The pilgrimage now underway. West of the Rockies, the monarchs are flying to Southern California for warmer weather, while on the East Coast, from as far north as Canada, the monarchs are currently flying as far as 3,500 miles for winter. Destination, the mountains of Mexico. Millions, and sometimes 10 millions, of monarch butterflies are getting ready to take an incredible journey down south to a place that they've never even been before, and they land in the mountains of Mexico. So many butterflies landing there that it looks like trees of butterflies and enchanted butterfly monarch forest. Why do they come here to Mexico instead of some other warm spot? It's one of Mother Nature's mysteries. It's an incredible phenomena, and they don't know why they land in the mountains of Mexico. So we're still trying to learn. There's so much to learn from them. Look at that beauty. There you go. <laughs> How do they find their way? Butterflies have a sort of GPS, like what your parents have on their phones. The monarch's antenna tells them where to go. They are just a butterfly. Butterflies, no matter what type, butterfly. catch our eye. But monarchs are special. No other butterfly makes such a long and intrepid journey. Did you know butterflies begin as eggs? And as we can see in the lab at Butterfly World in Coconut Creek, Florida, those eggs become caterpillars. These are what? These are monarch caterpillars. They're beautiful right now. Really beautiful. Eventually, the caterpillars shed their skin four to five times. And like a child hiding under the covers, the caterpillar is eventually covered by what's called a pupa. This is one of the uh, monarch pupas. Seven to 10 days later, the caterpillar transforms, emerging as a full-blown monarch butterfly. Because they live only six to eight weeks, as the monarchs fly from Mexico north, they lay eggs. Those butterflies eventually die, but those eggs hatch. And from caterpillar to butterflies, the new monarchs continue the flight north. It's like a relay race in school when you're in PE. And then the last generation, the fifth generation, the biggest, they're, the big, they're bigger, they're stronger. They can actually live eight times longer than the previous generation. It's that fifth generation of monarchs that's special, bigger, stronger, with one mission, to leave the only home they've known and use their built-in GPS to go to Mexico. You look up in the sky, they're everywhere. You go like little orange compasses flying across the sky, flying to the mountains. They must be exhausted. They must be, but it's, somebody's gotta do it. They gotta do it. If I could tell people and children one thing, get out in nature, you need to get out in nature. It's the key to happiness. And next year, they'll do it all over again. Lester? Carrie, thanks very much. Well, as you all know, this show is meant to be for you, for kids. And when we hear from one of you about what you want to see on the show, we listen. And what I found out is that one of our regular viewers, 10-year-old Lucy, wanted to know more about, well, me. Take a listen. Hi, I'm Lucy, and I really like Nightly News Kids Edition. What I want more of on this show is behind-the-scenes stuff. So I asked Lester if I could see behind the scenes of his other show, NBC Nightly News, Grown Ups Edition. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, the White House tonight. Lester works in the middle of New York City inside a famous building called 30 Rock, but he's had lots of other jobs. So what was your first ever job? My first ever job was working at a men's clothing store in Sacramento, California. And I had two jobs. One was to iron 
the clothes after they went to the tailor. I would have a big pressing machine and psh, and I would press them and hang them up. The other part of the job was doing janitorial work. So I cleaned up, I cleaned the bathrooms and some other unpleasant things. Uh, that was my first job when I was probably 15 or 16 years old. Did you ever get free pants for that? I never got free pants, but I got a discount. Oh, that's nice. Um, when did you start working for NBC? I started working for NBC in the year 2000. I was uh, an anchor at MSNBC. Hello and welcome. We're four days away from Decision 2000, and we just got another indication how close this race is, folks. Do you like your job? I, I really like my job. I actually love my job. I have an opportunity to meet amazing people, I arrive here in to Tokyo, travel the testing. world, um, to experience things that many other people will never have the chance to, and then I get to tell their stories. So I feel very privileged, and it's a really, really terrific job. Five, two, four, four three, Mike, two, anime. Good evening, tonight's some clarity on exactly who gets a place. He's what they call an anchor for the news program that's on at 6.30 every night. If the show's until 7 o'clock, when do you get to eat dinner? Uh, we finish the broadcast at 7, and then I usually have a few other things I have to do, so I leave around 7.20, 7.25, and uh, my wife is a wonderful cook, and uh, she often uh, prepares dinner. We, we get to eat around 8 o'clock. But why do they call you an anchor? That's a good question. I think they call us anchors because we hold down the show, like an anchor holds down a ship, that we hold down this broadcast and we have all these stories coming in and all this information and I'm the person that kind of presents it to everyone and so I kind of hold the broadcast down like an anchor holds a ship down. Lester told me he works with a lot of people. There are the producers, researchers, camera crews. Hey, Lester, so we could probably do page two now. And a whole control room full of people to help put the show together. How do you decide which stories to report each day? Well, you know, we start that process pretty early in the morning by emailing each other of the stories that we think are big for that day and which ones we're going to go with. We've got a lot of news to get to. We continue to discuss it as a team all day long as new stories develop. And we only have 30 minutes, so we want to try and find a mixture uh, that represents the day. So what do you do during the commercials? <laughs> during the commercials, I usually read the scripts for the next part of the, of the program. One minute back, one minute. The director will tell me he wants me to stand in a different place. Uh, he might tell me about some graphic that's behind me. So we're, we're basically conducting business um, during the commercial break. My little brother Aiden sent Lester a message to say hi. Hi, Lester. And my sister had a question of her own. Hi, Lester. My name is Zoe. I'm from New York City. I want to know what it's like to be famous so I can be famous one day just like you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Oh, what is it like to be famous? You know, it's very nice to be famous because not many people have a job where people will stop you on the street and say, hey, good job. And so I'm lucky that, that people do that. So that's a part of being famous I really like. Now, having said that, I'm not doing this to be famous. I'm doing this because I love being a news person. Um, the fame comes with it. Um, but as I said, it's, it's really nice to be appreciated. Well, I think Lester's job takes him all over the there, world. He smile. reports on the biggest stories there are. And I think that might be the kind of job I want one day. What advice do you have for a kid who wants to grow up and anchor the news? Well, I think that my advice for any kid that wants to grow up and anchor the news is first focus on being a reporter because really, you know, anchoring means sitting there kind of reading the news, but the most important part of my job is being a reporter. And you do that by going out like we are now in the field and talking to people and you know, being on the scene of big stories. It's also really important to work on your writing skills. You have to be able to write that story in a way that really communicates what's important about that story in a really short amount of time. As a child in school, I would say creative writing is really an important skill to learn. You know, read the news every day and watch the news every day and really find out what's happening. Lester gave me so much advice and guidance, but there was one more question I just had to ask him. 
Um, do you know Dr. John? Do you think you could get me an interview with him? I, you know, I think I can make some calls. Lester, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. It seems like you have a pretty cool job, and now we know a little bit more about how it works. For Nightly News Kids Edition, I'm Lucy, reporting from New York City. Lucy, thanks very much. That was fun, and you're a terrific interviewer. Finally, in our inspiring kids series, the boy who got to make a wish and decided what he really wanted was to help others. Here again is our friend, Kerry Sanders. 13-year-old Abraham Olegregi knows he's different. He was diagnosed with aplastic anemia, a type of bone marrow failure that can be fatal. The Make-A-Wish Foundation, a nonprofit that grants wishes to children dealing with critical illnesses, offered Abraham a trip to Disney, a PlayStation, even a 21-speed bike. But guess what? Abraham said, no thanks. Instead, you decided to what? Be the homeless. Why? We narrowed it down to either two things, a PlayStation or Feed the Homeless. And you know, like a PlayStation would be nice, but to me, I just feel like it wouldn't do the justice, like all the pain and stuff I went through. So I just felt like it would have been right to just feed the homeless and just to give back because somebody blessed me with the gift of life. Mom, what do you think here? It overwhelms me. It just gives me so much joy. Abraham's Make-A-Wish to Feed the Hungry comes as doctors say he's now on his way to a full recovery, thanks to a stranger donating life-saving bone marrow to him. Since he was nine, Abraham has joined his parents and nine brothers and sisters feeding the homeless in Jackson, Mississippi. The Make-A-Wish gift will allow him to plate 700 meals for the next eight months. After that, Abraham hopes to one day get a food truck to bring the food to those who need it. They do some stuff, like they do stew pots, but some of the homeless people have to walk to them. And you know, some people don't have cars, some people don't even have socks. So they have to walk on their bare feet through mud and rocks. So one thing about Abraham's table, we bring it to them so they wouldn't have to walk and stuff. So just to see his, his journey and to see him come through on the other side, and then for him to come out and have a wish such as this, it doesn't get any better than that. It really does. It's not every day a 13-year-old teaches us a lesson. Most of the homeless people, you know, they had good childhoods, and you just don't know one day you could be homeless. My mom always taught us to put, before you put your nose in somebody else's business, put your heart in their place first. Lester, what a role model. Uh, such a great example, he said. Kerry, thanks very much for bringing that story to us. Well, that's going to do it for us parents. Just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, we want to hear from you. So email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. And you can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everybody. And remember, take care of yourself and each other. So long.